Good afternoon, everyone. This is a little more intimate than this morning. Uh, nothing, nothing makes a small crowd more obvious if you have a room that can hold a few hundred. So thanks, thanks for sticking around. Uh, this, of course, is a presentation that was only added to the program fairly late. So I'm unsurprised and a lot of people are here. But to those who are hiding in the background, if you want to come a little closer, I don't bite and maybe I won't feel so lonely. So my name is Dirk Hondel. I run the open source program office at Verizon. This presentation has nothing to do with Verizon. So let's, let's forget about that. Uh, this presentation is all about an open source project that I personally find super interesting. And I indirectly kind of helped a tiny little bit get started. So, a um, little bit of background, I assume everyone who comes to a presentation like this actually knows the background, but I'll do it anyway. So, about five months ago, Redis, the company, which ironically is not the company that actually started Redis, but it's a company that just renamed themselves to be Redis. Um, they decided to change the license of the, the Redis key value data store to uh, two different licenses, both of which are not open source. And they did this after repeatedly in the past saying that Redis would forever be under the BSD license. Um, and a lot of people who believe in open source, a lot of people who used Redis under the terms of the open source licenses um, were very unhappy with that, understandably. And so the timing that Redis did this was super interesting because they did it during KubeCon Europe. So KubeCon, like this one, there aren't a lot of them, like three a year, right? And that's when everyone is together in the same place. So all the companies who were most annoyed by Redis doing this were already together in the same place. And eight days later comes the announcement that Valky is formed. The uh, maintainer themselves, Madeline and a few others, were actually ahead of this. So they had already forked the code. They had already started to create a new version. But the Linux Foundation, just over a week after the Redis announcement, announced the creation of Valky. And a couple of weeks later, the first release of Valky came out, Valky 7.2, which essentially is a direct fork of Redis. And I'll, I'll get to this later why this is important. Now, there is, there is a, a very common misunderstanding of, of two key facts that play into this. And I want to really focus on those two key facts. One, forks are good. Forks are one of the key things that open source licenses allow you. So if whoever it is, if the maintainer starts doing things you don't like, you have the ability to fork the code under the same license and do better. So if you think Linus Torvalds is not a good maintainer for the Linux kernel, you can fork it. Not sure how well this will go, but more power to you. And, and this is something where people say, oh, you know, the Linux Foundation is stealing the code. No, that's not what it is. We are using one of the most basic fundamental rights in open source projects to be able to continue the project under the previous license. So that's one. And the other often voiced misconception is, well, but Redis is right to do this because they need to be able to make money. Well, open source is not a business model. I've said this a few hundred times in the last few years. This is when, when Mongo relicensed, when Elasticsearch relicensed, when Terraform got relicensed. You know, pick your project. Uh, this week it was, or last week it was CockroachDB that relicensed. In every single one of these cases, you have to ask yourself, what did the company misunderstand about doing open source that years into the project, they suddenly realize, oh, if we actually do what we promise our users, create an open source project and maintain it, we can't make enough money. That means you, from the outset, hadn't thought about your business model. You had not figured out how you actually going to sustain the thing you were going to do. And to me, this is not a failure of the people who fork it. 
This is a failure of the people who caused the fork, the people who relicensed their project. And I will cheer on every community that wants to respond this way to a relicensing. I call this bait and switch. You have a project that's under an open source license. You create a community around that because it's open source. And then you switch the license on them. And you assume that people will start play, paying you money. That is not how things should work. And I'm very happy that the Linux Foundation, with very little nudging from a few interested people, myself included, um, very quickly responded and created Valky as a project. Now, um, when you fork a project, there is always this risk that, well, it's the assumption, as I joked earlier about Linux, the assumption is that the original project is the healthier one. The assumption is that most maintainers are at the company. It's really hard to successfully fork a project. Here in this case, I think the, the signs look very promising. We have a release out. We have a release candidate for the next major release out. We have a significant part of the active developer community publicly declaring that they consider themselves Valky developers now and not Redis developers now. We have significant commitment from the large cloud vendors to, to use Valky in their cloud services. Uh, Madeline, the, the main maintainer of Valky, actually works for AWS. And so, to me, this is a, uh, there are a lot of good indications here that Valky will indeed be the, the future standard in this space. And in a few years, people will look back and will write Harvard Business School uh, papers on the failures of losing your community and losing your project because you're making bad decisions. And, I, uh, I think many people know I am somewhat involved in the Linux Foundation, even though I'm officially no longer on the board. I, I used to be on the board. I have been around the Linux Foundation since before it existed. Um, but I think that the Linux Foundation is a phenomenal steward for a project like this. What the Linux Foundation is best at and why we are all here is to create and maintain and help foster communities around open source. That's what they do. So having the Linux Foundation as steward for this fork is a very good sign. So I should say the slides are not mine. And the reason that you know the slides are not mine is because I don't do slides. I, I usually speak without slides because I am terrible at creating slides. And so I am very grateful to the Valky team for giving me slides, which drives a little bit the flow of the presentation, which is slightly different how I usually talk, but I'm happy to follow along. This is one of those typical charts that a project says, really, really, we are serious. We know what we're doing. We, we have what it takes. And I think this here is the line that really talks about we have what it takes. Of the companies that were actively engaged in Redis, two-thirds have already publicly stated that they are now actively engaged in Valky. Um, more than 40 companies have talked about Valky as the, 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 the future platform that they're going to use, including the company that I work for. There are a lot of active contributors in the relatively short time since the fork. Um, we had more than 80 people show up and contribute court. A lot of people get you know, spoiled by the numbers that Linux puts up. Yes, Linux has several thousand, four, five, six, ten thousand 10,000 different contributors in every release. That is an absolute outlier. For a typical open source project, if you have more than 10 contributors, that is remarkable. And if you have 80 contributors showing up to a project in its first five months, that is spectacular. So it's a really, really good good sign for the health of the project. Um, corporate supporters, this is just three. This is, of course, with Alibaba a little bit uh, attuned towards this audience. But much more important than the quotes from the corporate supporters is them actually showing up. We have a bi-weekly call of the people who are trying to launch this 
talking about when are the clouds going to be ready, when are the releases going to go out, how do we get training uh, in place, how do we help people migrate, what are the steps forward to, to get this out to the users. And that to me is really the strength of what Valky is doing. And of course, the reason why you fork a project like this is because you want it to have a healthy open source based future. And when you have a company behind an open source project, that's a wonderful thing. I am super happy to see so many companies, so many VCs fund these initiatives, so much value being created by companies. However, very often what happens with companies after the initial excitement is that then there is a lot of very careful managing of progress. Here is a feature that a developer in the community wants to add and the company says, mm, yeah, but we have this commercial thing that we're doing that's kind of in conflict. And so let's, let's slow walk that. Um, and specifically around performance of Redis, there has been a long ongoing disagreement in, in the community and Snap actually forked Redis a while ago and created um, KeyStoreDB, KeyDB. Oh. Of course, now I should know the name. Asterisk, I will follow up with the name. Um, so there was an earlier fork by Snap that was all around performance because people were frustrated with the way Redis approached performance. And there are more things around how do the clusters work? How is the memory footprint? How is the infrastructure in the replication of the, the, the data stores between different nodes. A lot of challenges with observability. Anybody who builds large clusters knows the first thing you want to know is when things go wrong. So you have to good ability to get logs, to get information, to get notifications from the different nodes in the cluster. In all of these areas, the Valky community has already started to make changes and has a roadmap out of what's going to happen. So this is not just talking about, oh, eventually, maybe we'll do this. The first release candidate of Valky 8 is out. You can play with it. It's actually pretty stable. I'm using it in one of my websites and I'm quite happy about it. And beyond that, there's already work planned for features that the community has asked for for quite a while. I think the number one is the native JSON data type. That is something that has been on the wish list since as long as I've been using Redis, which has been a long time. Um, JSON objects are, if, if you're building a web application, everything comes in JSON. And today when you use Redis, you now serialize them and store a string or whatever you do. It's it's not as seamless as it should be. So that's something that will come in uh, the following uh, Valky release, a, a native Bloom filter data type, um, full text search capability. That's another one that a lot of people ask for. Now, typically when you think about a key value database, you don't think that full text search would be high on the list of requests. But if you think about how Redis, now Valky, is typically used in web applications. Very often the data that you end up storing in your synchronization layer, in your, in your cache layer, are inputs, are data fields of your application. And the ability to search those seamlessly through the API is extremely useful. And uh, clustering. If we look at, I mean, this is KubeCon, right? This is all about being able to scale out applications, so run uh, your key value store across a lot of nodes, which means building clusters and creating fast, reliable, stable clusters that are able to uh, withstand changes in their, in their infrastructure. So adding more nodes, removing more nodes, failing over, creating backups, restoring them. A lot of that infrastructure is being worked on to make it more durable, make it more reliable and better performing. Um, I won't go into the, into the technical details of the performance work. Uh, I am an engineer. I have not worked deeply with the Valky code. 
And instead of making myself look dumb, I will not pretend that I can explain this to you. I, I have a slide a little later on some of the existing performance optimizations where I've seen the code. These here I can't explain, so I won't try. Normally, Madeline gives this presentation, and she certainly can. She knows a lot more than I do about this. So this is what I talked about in performance. The, the multi-threaded architecture of how you do I.O. in a key value database is really, really important. Because you, if you have very active write and subsequent read operations on your data set, even though a lot of what you do is you keep in memory, you will end up going to I.O. And the moment you have an I.O. interface that serializes at any point in the process, you will run into bottlenecks and you will run into performance issues. And so this is really the, the biggest change that is user visible in, in Valky 8.0, which is the ability to create scaling in the node. I mean, obviously, in a cluster, horizontal scaling about many nodes has always been an option. But the performance of the individual nodes becomes significantly better if you can take advantage of multiple threads writing out the data without having to have a sync point at the end of all of these I.O. operations before you hand back to the, uh, the main thread. And this is really what, what is new here, that the jobs do not block at the end of the process. The block, the jobs and the threads keep running. And so your main thread doesn't have to wait for the I.O. to complete in order for it to uh, um, continue. So in, in Valky 7, which is based on the Redis core, you have this limitation. You can have multiple threads writing, but you wait at the end, you block until you're done, and that is removed in Valky 8. The performance numbers, I think, are really cool. I can't guarantee that this will look as impressive on any workload, but on my totally harmless small little workload on a little airplane tracking thing that I do as a hobby, I see roughly this, I see roughly a three times improvement in performance. I, I stream in a lot of data, about 60 million data points a day. So there is a pretty significant load on these systems and you really can tell when I migrate simply in my performance chart, there is a significant improvement to be found. Uh, obviously, benchmarks are never the same as running your actual application. So I love about open source, you can simply try it and see for yourself. But I think this will be the, the number one reason why people will look as, at Valky as an alternative. And this is the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I forgot when I was talking about the second slide. So, if you are using Redis today in your application, if you're a company and you are trying to figure out, can I continue to use Redis starting with 7.4, you got to talk to your lawyers because depending on who your lawyer is and what they think about the new license, they may tell you, I am sorry, in my enterprise, you cannot run this code because we cannot comply with the license. So there will be a lot of people who will get asked by their legal teams to migrate from Redis to something else. But fundamentally, that is always kind of a disappointing reason to have to migrate. This is always a disappointing story that you have to do this because the lawyers. This is why I want you to migrate. I want you to migrate because it's better technology. It's something that is driven by a community, something that is very well maintained, and something that makes a difference for your applications. And so I am most happy about the speed in which this community has gone from not existing to doing a fork, figuring out the governance, getting it all started, and then getting actual useful work done. Now, the secret behind that is, of course, that all of these people have been working on this code in the past, and they've already been working on that and just couldn't get these changes into Redis for the reasons I talked about earlier. But still, I think this really is the highlight. This is what is interesting about seeing a healthy project 
being established in this community that continues the development on Redis. And I should have done this earlier. How many of you actually have applications that use Redis? For how many of you is this? Yeah, see, okay. The majority of hands are going up. Thank you for that. Because that really is, I mean, you use this as a cache layer. You care about performance most, most of everything. And yes, if, if, you, if you have a little website and, and you, you store 50 things a day, yeah, I mean, okay, whatever. If you store 50 million, things get different. And if you store, uh, one of the, the folks on the call last week talked about moving two terabytes a day through their uh, uh, cache. And now you really care about performance. Um, and speaking about the large data amounts, this is such a trivial little change. This is something where you go to your computer science 101 data structure classes and you say, oh yeah, I remember that picture. So the difference between having a pointer point to a small piece of data and simply embedding the data in your structure. If you analyze the things that you store in your key value cache, if what you're storing is multi-kilobyte text fields, this makes no difference. But if what you're storing is integers, if what you're storing is small strings, this has a significant impact on your memory footprint. Memory footprint is cost, is performance, and memory footprint makes a difference the larger your data set gets. So this is a fairly small improvement. Let's call it roughly 8% on a typical use case. Yeah, you're laughing. 8% if you're storing terabytes of data, it's a lot of data. This one similarly is straight out of Don Knuth's book. So what do you do? Do you have an extra level of indirection to decide which, uh, um, it's not a, sh a shard, what do they call it? Which slot you're looking at? Or do you have separate hash tables for each of the various slots? You remove one level of indirection, has direct impact on your memory footprint, and through that direct impact on your performance. And the reason why I love that these two little examples are in this slide deck, because they are so obvious. They are things where you're saying, why hasn't this been done ages ago? Who resisted these changes? And isn't it great that simple things like that can now get done? I'm sure there are many more opportunities like this, and I, I know that Madeline has a few bigger ones that she's thinking through, but to me, this is what is fun about a healthy, alive community. And this is what more and more projects need, need to do, to listen to the developers. I love to see people staring at the screen, that's nice. Again, a, a possibly not 100% representative example, but simply it talks about as you have a cluster, and instead of having the two level indirection, you have separate hash tables for each of your uh, slots, you get something like a 20% memory footprint reduction in those tables. That's nice, that makes a difference and uh, could reduce your Amazon bill. Oh, Amazon is doing that work, that's interesting. So the, the last thing that I wanna talk about today, um, migration from Redis to Valky because it's great to say, hey, uh, Valky is out there. If you're starting a greenfield application, you're building a new thing, obviously use Valky, it's easy. But if you already are using Redis, how do you get there? Well, it starts with the very simple statement that Redis 7.2 is, of course, exactly the same thing as Valky 7.2. So this is just the same code and you just run it under a different name. Configuration is the same, setup is the same, API is the same, commands are the same, the, the wire protocol, everything is identical. So the migration from 7.2 to 7.2 is a complete no-brainer. Um, oh, I have not clicked enough, client libraries, same. It's the same code. It's not a, it's just compatible, it's the same code that you're running. 
when you have that running and it's life, what do you do? So the, the easiest way is actually, well, the easiest way for the amateur sysadmin over here, talking about myself, is the one in the middle. So that's what I did. Back it up, shut it down, start the new one, restore, and even with a you know few hundred megabyte uh, data set, it's like 10 second downtime and you have it up and running. Super easy. You can actually do a rolling update migration, which I was not brave enough to try. So you can substitute nodes in your cluster with Valky and have it simply as it updates the data, write the data to the new node and iteratively remove the Redis systems and change it all over to, to Valky. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is maybe above my pay grade when it comes to maintaining large clusters. Um, and there are actually a couple of companies that have tools to do that. So that especially for more complex environments allow you to, to do the migration over um, without any downtime. So you can simply continue doing this. And there are a number of companies that have already said that they are offering support and services around Valky. So Percona is one of them. There are a bunch of others. Um, the large clouds have all said that they're going to offer this in their systems. The official launch dates are, as always, top secret, but uh, I'm, I'm sure relatively soon we will see the large clouds either migrate you by themselves because you're using one of their higher level applications where, where Redis and Valky are just a component, or offer you ways to update your uh, Redis service that you get from them today. Um, finally, the call to action, of course, get involved. Get the code, play with it. Get it from the Docker repo, uh, yeah, from the Docker um, repository and the Docker Hub. Um, Valky, Valky, uh, nice to find. Valky.io is the GitHub domain. And I would love to see more engagement. We already have a pretty substantial Chinese a uh, uh, faction in the developers. I actually see a lot more white people in the room than I expected. It's kind of fun. Uh, you, you go to China. <laughs> anyway, uh, but it, it is a, a global community already, and we're always happy to see more people show up. And personally, what I am most interested in is to get more stories from people who tried it. Success stories, failure stories, what went wrong, what didn't we get right, where are problems with the documentation, what are you looking for, how can this community be the better partner for you as you're using this. So I, I have left a few minutes at the end for questions. We don't have a microphone for the room, so if you yell out questions that you have, I can repeat them and hopefully I know the answer. You don't get to ask questions, I can't answer your questions. Either the presentation was that good or that bad. <laughs> okay, then with that, thank you very much. Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon. This is the, the second worst slot that you can have, um, because there's one more after me. But um, I am really appreciative that on short notice so many of you showed up. Have a good rest of your day and have a safe trip home for those for which this is a little further. Um, and see you soon.